Well, welcome everyone. Um, session two, about to start. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the first session this morning. We're covering the priority areas for the sheep industry. Uh, my name's Crosby Cleland. I'm the vice chairman of the Sheep Health and Animal Welfare Group. And um, it's my job to introduce our speakers. And the first one we have is um, Jasmine Keller. Um, Jasmine is a professor of epidemiology, I hope I've got that right, and precision livestock informatics and leads the <laughs> ruminant population health research at the Bet School of, and at the University of Nottingham. Um, she has she's extensive, extensively researched farmer and vet decision making on lameness, biosecurity, antibacterial use, and recently on technology adoption and sheep scab. So I'm going to ask uh, Jasmine to go ahead now, um, and our subject is understanding and influence of behaviour and adopting good practice. So over to you, Jasmine. Uh, thanks, Crosby. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Shog for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk, actually, which I think is a, a difficult understanding, influencing, uh, uh, and adopting good practice. I'm going to share my uh, screen now. Okay, so I think uh, when Liz gave me uh, this topic, sort of understanding and influencing uh, behavior in, in terms of adoption of any practice, best practice, it's a, it's a, it's a wide topic. So I try to do a bit of justice in, in 20 minutes. So what I really want to cover in this talk is I want to talk about behavior change, uh, maybe give you some insights from uh, social science in a terms of our understanding in how to influence mm -hmm. behavior, what impacts behavior, and uh, also look at some of the examples uh, in, in using those sort of uh, theories on from social science. So why do people behave in certain ways? Um, and I think we are interested in behavior because we know uh, we behave in a certain way and not always follow the best practice. But I think to understand a little bit more, I think we, we need to understand a little bit what agreed definition is of behavior. So behavior is anything a person does in response to internal or external events. And I think one of the things uh, to understand around behaviors is uh, these are events, but they are controlled in some way by the brain. So why are we interested in behavior change? If we think there is overwhelming evidence that changing people's health-related behavior can have major impact on uh, most causes for uh, mortality and morbidity. So if we look at sort of in terms of lifestyle factors, so 70% of all deaths were, were caused by mm -hmm. non-communicable diseases. And if we look, I mean, uh, as, as we have evolved, there are more additional challenges that are associated with behavior. For example, television or screen time and, and, and health. So there are many theories of behavior, but I think what I really want to talk first about is this problem of intuitive or common sense model. So different people uh, and disciplines have different intuition because behavior is something that applies to everybody. Uh, we, we sort of think we know what is influencing it. And I think what I call or what uh, behavior psychologists call this is like an implicit theory. So meaning we think we have an idea what influences behavior and we try to then use that idea to change and i think we don't benefit from the evidence and it doesn't lead to any behavior change and the example you can say in terms of um absence makes the heart grow fonder could be a one implicit theory or out of sight out of mind would be another one and i think the problem with these implicit theory is that they are often wrong so many times that uh, uh, the influence of knowledge or education has been put that if you if you are more educated or if you have more knowledge about something, uh, your behavior will change. And I think that's 
uh, and that's not the case and there is evidence to suggest that and i think it also implies that we when we are making these decisions they are very conscious which they are not okay i i i think we are all have been impacted by covid and i think talking about behavior i thought i'll i'll mention a little bit covid and in terms of covid our uh, the main behavior is around adherence to rule and the guidance and we saw many examples over the lockdown where the rules were broken uh, uh, and they were in the media uh, uh, there as well. The example of this implicit theory or something that somebody thought, um, the terminology that was used was behavior fatigue. So I don't know if you remember some of the, uh, the briefings that happened early on. And uh, one of, in one of the briefings, Professor Witte mentioned about uh, not uh, using the word behavior fatigue to justify uh, strict social distancing. So there were uh, after that there were a lot of health psychologists that actually wrote and, and there was a letter and Susan Mickey, which is a professor of health psychology, uh, uh, and, and other members which are uh, advising the government, they said that actually behavior fatigue was an ill-defined term with no evidence in behavioral science, and suggested that common sense understanding is not enough, and it often leads to interventions that are actually counterproductive. So I think the point I'm making here, here is that sometimes uh, people use these implicit theories to uh, implement an intervention and those interventions uh, don't work and are not justified. And especially in COVID, that's, uh, that's been the case of using uh, a common sense approach. Okay, so now I'm gonna move from, from this to thinking about um, pharma behavior, vet behavior. So I started researching um, around sheep lameness in 2004, and I worked around lameness, identifying what's sort of the best practice. And I think later on, uh, during after my PhD, one of the key thing was that how to, do we implement this best practice? How do we implement it? And, and there, my interest grew into understanding more around farmer and, and, and vet behavior. So I think our behavior implements in terms of uh, the health and welfare outcomes that we see on farms. Okay, so let's start by a little bit more insight into uh, understanding this. So in health psychology, uh, there are many theories and what these theories tell us is that how a behavior happens in the real world. And there are, in this example, X, A, B, C, and these could be different elements that are influencing the behavior. So the insights come from behavior economics, health psychology, and sociology. So the most common model uh, that is actually used and that's relevant is a model called COMBI. So what happens in the health psychology field that there were 82 theories that were telling us that why a behavior happens. And then the researchers actually combined all that effort into uh, a, a model called COMBI, which is a very simple model that tells us that a behavior is influenced by three main things. The first is capability, and capability is anything related to knowledge, skills, or our ability to engage in a behavior. And then is an opportunity opportunity meanings the factors that are outside our control uh, environmental physical social that impacts the the, uh, the behavior but what these two also do is they impact our motivation and motivation is sort of the brain process of our reasoning our uh, deliberation reflection uh, as well as the automatic things that we do that that impacts the behavior so essentially what it is for any behavior to happen, these three elements are influencing that process. So if we, if we break down these, uh, we could look into, for example, the physical capability is something to do with physical strength. We have a skill, uh, st stamina to do it. Psychological capability is all when we say, actually, do we have understanding in disease control is around knowledge. Do we have understanding of how the disease transmit? And that sort of impacts your psychological capability. Opportunity, we all sort of look around 
what are the factors that are in the environment, which is around we don't have time to perform a behavior, uh, uh, don't have money to implement, for example, uh, a certain biosecurity measure, et cetera. So these are the physical opportunity that are impacting uh, how we manage disease or, or any behavior. Social opportunities around social factors, cultural norms. So what everybody else is doing, what should we be doing? Uh, these are the social norms that impact our behavior. Reflective motivation is our plans and evaluation. And I'm going to give you an example a, a little bit later about that. Um, and finally, the automatic motivation, which is the, the habits or impulses that we have. Okay, so now we know that the simple model of combi that can impact our behavior. Let's see an example. So when uh, the group in, in, in uh, UCL, Susan Mickey's group, uh, published this in, in 2011, um, at that stage, we were looking at um, VETS behavior. And uh, this is the work we published uh, uh, later in 2015. And it is around a proactive role by the VET. So preventative services offered by veterinarians on sheep farms in England and Wales. And here we were looking at what are the pro, uh, drivers for that proactive flock health planning. So we applied that model. So there were what we were interested in, the amount of time that spent in an advisory role on sheep farms. And actually what we found was that there were three factors that were uh, coming from the same combi that were impacting them. So motivation, uh, so the vets, uh, who felt that the clients were happy with the services they were providing were more likely to spend more time uh, in an advisory role. Reflective motivation was where vets were thinking, uh, I am my client's primary source of advice. Uh, I know what my client's needs are. So these were the reflective sides of the motivation. And these reflective evaluations uh, not only included uh, uh, their own actions, but also included uh, uh, what they, the thoughts were, what they thought the cheap clients were thinking. So vets who thought that clients were not willing to pay were less likely to spend time in an advisory role. And there could be a whole range of factors behind that belief. The second factor was around capability. And what we found was that um, vets who didn't feel they had uh, enough knowledge around sheep farming or other aspects of, uh, uh, on sheep husbandry were less likely to uh, uh, be more proactive. And all motivation uh, capability was affecting their motivation. In terms of opportunity, we had a uh, physical and social opportunities. So VET felt that they were not av available models of uh, uh, working in this type of scenario, uh, how that charging model could work, how could they uh, uh, fit into that role. So it was lack of uh, the marketing scale, lack of uh, awareness of these models impacted that. So here I give you an example of how uh, these three factors sort of impacted a, a behavior and resulted in an outcome. So in a scenario where we want to change that, we have to think about altering these elements and that's how we will uh, implement some change in that behavior. Okay, so this is all well and good. One of the other thought of uh, is around that actually in our mind, there, there are a dual processing going on. So we have this reasoning reflective uh, deliberative, which is system one, and we have this impulsive automatic, which is system two. So we have slow and fast a way how we, uh, how the behavior happens. So example, I sort of say, you know, I, I am in this situation many times. I don't intend to eat chocolate cake. Oops, but habits are be, they beat the reasoning. So I think it's very important to understand that these two system uh, occur and then you know, in, when we are performing behaviors, they, they, they impact, for example, habits. So if we think about what we know about different elements, so knowledge, attitudes, what we think the behavior will lead to, 
uh, whether we think we can perform the behavior and all the action plans, they are all in a reasoning slow system. And then we have all the habits that we do are in a fast system. So you, you need to think in terms of how we can alter that reasoning slow system, but also this, the habits part, which is generally we tend to forget because we emphasize sometimes too much on the, on the, on the reasoning and the slow system. It's not to say that we shouldn't focus on that, but I think it's important to understand that these are how these two systems are working. So I thought of an example, I was sort of thinking, and I found kind of a, a very interesting one around uh, reducing chocolate con uh, consumption. So the belief, which is sort of a, a motivational thinking, deliberately so, slow system, it's bad for me to eat chocolate, too much chocolate, and that belief will impact my attitude, would say, okay, I would like to eat less chocolate, it would then impact my intention. I intend to eat less chocolate. And I think intentions we know always don't lead to behavior. I need to have a plan, a clear plan, how to reduce my chocolate consumption. And that's where the habits can be quite useful. So having only eating chocolate at weekend, and then it would impact the behavior that I eat the right amount of chocolate. Sometimes we, we think that it's only the direction of, of behavior is only coming through belief and attitudes, and that's how we are impacting behavior. But I think it's very important to understand that sometimes behavior then start impacting our belief as well. So, for example, in this scenario, you know, we all been there, um, had a chocolate cake, and then you sort of say, you, you, you change your belief in terms of uh, to match your behavior. You said, okay, I, work, I worked very hard and, 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 and that's a reward. So I think it's very important to understand how these different factors are at play. Okay, moving on to uh, a, a more recent way of changing behavior. Uh, uh, this is around behavior nudges. And I think this kind of goes to uh, uh, a more on to behavior economic side and this system one and system two. So behaviors have biases and it is affected by heuristic and environment and the context we make those choices. So what uh, this theory, and there was a, a bestseller book about thinking fast and slow and, and, and the nudge theory are based on this fact that actually our decisions and behaviors are not rational. So actually, what we can do is we, instead of sort of changing uh, uh, a, a lot, we should think of more uh, simple, not um, cost-effective ways mm -hmm. whether we can change um, uh, change these. So um, the example here is framing. Framing is an example where where you can uh, change the behavior. So, for example, ninety-one percent fat-free or or nine percent is an example. So I'm going to give a very quick example of, of uh, some work we did around antibiotic use. So we looked at sort of um, sheep farmers and bee farmers interviews in sort of say how we can um, understand their decision around antibiotic use. But we focused on uh, RIMA national targets reduction that were published in 2017, which was around 10 percent industry uh, reduction targets. So we use that to then evaluate how targets could be most effective. So what the research told us that all farmers were concerned about AMR, so they definitely there is an intention. However, there were sometimes the responsibility was put on to sort of say bad farmers or other farmers to reduce the use. And farmers perceived their anti usage was already low and reducing the use would have a negative impact. And also the main source of information for support for antibiotic reduction was wet, but there were barriers we already know for regular contact. And also it was a belief that it should be wet's responsibility to monitor. And I think the key thing is in this case, they indicated without knowing the baseline very accurately, they can't measure their progress against the tar target. So how can we, use this in terms of implication and suggestion in terms of policy is that we could frame uh, 
the, 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 this thing from reducing to appropriate use. And then the responsibility belongs to everyone. And it also prevents the conflicts with other recommendations. The other part is uh, we can't have an, uh, given a numerical target if we don't have, at the moment, tools and technology, uh, which we will have soon, uh, uh, to know the numerical usage. So I think framing of um, the targets could be done slightly differently. And we, it was great uh, of some of the work that has gone into the, the new uh, targets task force report in, in 2020. So finally, I uh, want to say that behavior is complex. Uh, the key thing is to avoid the common sense model, which we all have tendency to do. We have various proven frameworks for behavior change, which we should implement for, for our industry. And I think efforts should focus on changing the slow system, which is around knowledge and, and beliefs and attitude, but also the fast system, which are nudges, how we frame things. And just wanted to, to share very quickly um, <coughs> didn't manage it well but i think the 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 this clip was showing that how we could encourage people to to use the stairs by just nudging them and making it look and i think we saw the nudges in covid with the lines drawn in supermarket these are all the behavior nudges that we had i think i'll stop sharing now Ah, Jasmine, wow. <laughs> you have covered, I would say you have covered the last 40 or 50 years of my life being a farmer, a sheep farmer, and wondering whether I'm doing right or wrong. <laughs> a lot of those really hit home to me. But it would come to me, it, it's really a combination. Are, are you saying that it really, it's up to the farmer to try and progress by going out and asking the advisor or asking the vet or where would the response where would the way forward be that you would see best for a farmer uh thanks thanks rosby yeah it was it was difficult to cover all, all that but i think uh, i think the key thing to understand is to work with with the wet to implement the, the changes onto the farm and i think that's very key because if you think from a very science point of view that's work to get uh, working together with the wet would it affect the motivation as well as the impact the opportunity component and that would then impact the the behavior itself so i think it's it's uh, it's about sort of working together to implement the changes uh in the way and i think as i said uh changing habits is is a very very difficult thing as well <laughs> oh that is a that is a really big one um but certainly i i have got uh animal health I have worked out through the year what we're going to do with our vet and it's with the WhatsApp things at the various things and various ways now of contacting. It's marvelous way forward. I've worked now with the vet and just exactly what you're saying, the behavioral changes. I have worked along with the vet to make changes within my flock and they have been good. I mean, I'm not going to promote anything in particular, but I'd certainly we had problems with feet. We've tried the foot back. I think it has worked. But again, that word think comes in, but at least I'm thinking about it. And certainly there are a lot more things that we can do uh, within our own farming industry that would help us along and, and bring others into it because it's not up to the farmer alone. I take it you would agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it's a, uh, it's a social norm about everybody else sort of, uh, mm -hmm. coming along with the, with the change and following the best practice that, uh, you know, so it's not only the individual's responsibility, in the sense, I think if we always put the onus of change to individual, I I don't think behavior change occur. I think it it has to the context has to change as well. You know, uh, in that case, you know, allowing opportunities for uh, whether those would be physical or social norms have to change for for a behavior to 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 be implemented in a way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm following you on that. And uh, an interesting question, I'll let you try and answer it. How does the card 
and or stick fit into the behavior outcomes? So I think it's a it's a difficult uh, question, <laughs> a very good question. I think um, if we think about uh, the behavior change itself, previously a lot of emphasis was put on the stick a lot. But I think this whole thing about behavior nudge actually gives uh, goes opposite to the uh, to to making people do things. But actually, it is nudging them to do. So they still have the choice, but it is using these behavior nudges because it's accepting the fact that everybody has different attitudes uh, uh, and beliefs, uh, and decisions are not rational. So you already accept that decisions are not rational. So it's about thinking, how can we use these simple cost-effective nudges uh, and social norm? And I think uh, everybody doing that and creating a social norm, then behavior changes. Yeah, and the other comment you made, the biggest uh, restriction in taking a farmer forward, leading a farmer forward into finding out why or what, it, it's time and money would be the big factor that always comes into their head. But uh, again, if we look at if an animal, you know, if an animal dies, sometimes you'll just surmise it is this, it is that. Advice would be, I suppose, the vets are naturally going to say, let's do post-mortem and we can take things from there. That's where the money comes in and the time. But I think you're quite right. This is essential that we the farmer does move forward and try to find out why and then work with ways to remedy it so it doesn't happen again. Time and money. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, yes, absolutely, time and money. But I think to sometimes we also see, and we have seen in biosecurity, sometimes we put onus quite a lot on time and money, and we are not putting onus on other things and other other factors that could support the decision making in the sense. I think sort of, you know, you mentioned about working with the, working with the vet and when you see a reward you mentioned earlier you know when you see a change uh, happen on and you have a positive change it changes your belief it gives you more motivation you know i see uh, for example i was thinking of going to the you know when there was a exercising more in the lockdown and you you sort of before i always had i don't have time and when i was doing it i suddenly felt i did have time so I think it's it's an interesting way of how uh, our actions, our behavior, when we start doing them, change our belief itself as well. Yeah, lockdown really has put a big change into our life. And I mean, the other one would be, I think, over in the mainland, as I call the mainland in England, there are health clubs. Um, in Northern Ireland, they have actually business groups for sheep farmers, and there's up to uh, 15, 20 farmers meet each month and have a good discussion about things. These are the ones that we really get. It's not only happening to me, and it's good to hear what somebody else has done. It gives them a chance to come out from it, and that that certainly is coming into the behaviour pattern that you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's one farm assurance. I assume it's a stick. Would you, you know, is but the carrot might be the contract with the retailer. Yeah, that's that's something we haven't discussed. The retailer. Yes, I mean, I, I think there is a there. So in this case, sort of uh, retail is sort of the outside other opportunity, other influence that would impact the behavior. So definitely, I, I you know, I think that's a, uh, that is a carrot for for the change to happen, of course. Yeah, and I think we've already mentioned it, just checking on it. Uh, now that we all have an annual review, well, not everybody yet, but hopefully a lot more will be going for annual reviews with their vets. Has, there, has this been beneficial in influencing the farmer's behaviour? Yes, I, th I think it's 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 uh, it's important in terms of uh, that when having that annual review, which gives you time and space to reflect. And I think again, it's not only annual review. I think I think I would bring in sort of flock health clubs and how they have been a, a good way of ch changing the practice and having having that proactive relationship with the vet and have implementing changes onto the farm. Yeah, which then would be change the intention of the farmer and make them, let them get a plan to set yeah. the whole thing up. What, as an example of a, what would you, would be an example of a nudge for antibiotic use? What would that be? So I think, I mean, I gave, I've tried to give the example uh, of the nudge in terms of framing 
uh, framing it in a way where it is more around emphasizing the positive impact and uh, the positive impact of using uh, other alternatives, you know, cluster management, etc. So I think these these are the how can we frame rather than where we were framing it more like a reduction. I think that's that's an example of a framing where framing is responsible use and emphasizing that and emphasizing the positive impact of those changes. Uh, Jasmine, we've really come to the end of our time now before we move on to the next speaker. But look, thank you very much for all your time and certainly answering the questions. They're not simple. Thank you, <laughs> Jasmine. Oh, thanks, Rosby. OK, great. Thanks. Uh, OK, our, our next speaker, um, well, <laughs> everybody knows him. Sam Yulboon. Sam, I've known Sam for years. Well, I have a nickname of Mr. Signet. Sorry about that, Sam. Sam is the manager of the Signet Breeding Services at the AHDB. Sam joined the MLC in 1998 as a beef and sheep consultant and quickly progressed to manage the Signet team. His day-to-day -day responsibilities include the delivery of the National Sheep Breeding Improvement Service to over 500 pedigree sheep breeders, including the provision of national ultrasound scanning service. He also works with teams outside the ASTB support services like CT scanning and breeding for parasite resistance. There's a lot more that I can say about you, Sam, and it's all good, but I'm going to hand it straight to you, and you're going to be talking about the breeding for the health and welfare. Thank you, Crosby. That's lovely. That's great. Bring my slides up if that's possible. Fantastic. Well, certainly when I started with MLC, we were projecting plastic acetates onto bed sheets nailed to the side of a barn. So I hope everyone's using the technology. I can certainly see that that's progressed a lot in the last 20 years. I'm going to be talking about the genetic opportunities to enhance sheep uh, health and welfare. Um, so that's doing it through performance recording and breeding improvement. I'm going to use a couple of very short case studies looking at uh, AHGB funded work on new longevity, lamb survival. Uh, going to talk about breeding for worm resistance and then a little bit of a look to the future. So for those that don't know, uh, Signet is part of AHGB. As Crosby said, we run the genetic evaluation services uh, as well as providing ultrasound scanning supporting the work of the CT unit, breeding for parasite resistance. And over my 20 years, I've been involved in many projects. The more recent ones would include uh, Ram Compare, uh, the Welsh Hill Sheep Breeding Project, uh, a new one that's CL joint funded, uh, looking at maternal genetics, and a quick plug for the sheep breed survey, which should have gone through the letterbox of, of every farmer uh, within recent weeks. Please do fill that in and send that back to assist our work. Many of those projects will be up on the, the Signet website. We've had massive changes in the last three years in the way that we actually undertake genetic evaluations. We've moved from individual breed analyses to mixed breed genetic evaluations with the new terminal sire evaluation delivered in 2018, uh, hill sheep evaluation last year, and we're currently working on a multi-breed approach for our lowland maternal breeds. So some really big changes enables us to take into account things like hybrid vigor within our breeding programs, but it also has enabled us to update our breeding values to make them more commercially focused and to bring in some new traits into our evaluations. The other thing is that they're now available on a monthly basis, so farmers can make uh, better decisions more quickly. Uh, but the same principles remain. Uh, when we're out there looking at animals, we know the appearance of the animal is influenced by the animal's genetics from mum and dad, and it's influenced from the environmental effect. So the age of the animal, the sex, how much feed it's had in front of him, all have a massive impact. And our job's to untangle those influences. And in some cases, we're fortunate that genetics has a, a big impact on the variation that you see between animals. And in that case, we've got relatively high heritability traits like growth rate. However, for health and welfare traits, the environment tends to have a massive impact and genetics has a smaller impact. So traits like fertility and lamb survival 
the genetic influence is much smaller. And it was interesting, the conversations that Fiona and Leslie were having this morning about don't forget about genetics. And of course, I would say, yes, don't forget about genetics. But equally, we do need to think about how much each of those factors influences the variation in our animals. Now, just because genetics have a small influence doesn't mean that they're not important. We know that they have a very high economic value to industry. You can see figures here for parasite challenge and uh, lameness <clears throat> from uh, well over 10 years ago. It has a massive impact on the industry. And because we're uh, ideally performance recording many of the elite breeding flocks that go on to supply other ram breeders that go on to have an impact across the industry, then the prize is absolutely massive. So genetics can have a really important role because of the, the cumulative benefits that can be built up year on year. When I started with Signet, we had about seven traits or breeding values that we could select for. Uh, early growth rate, carcass attributes using ultrasound, the number of lambs produced, and the milking ability of the female line. Today, we've got nearly 30 through our various research projects or ongoing recording services, be those carcass traits assessed through the CT unit, abattoir-derived traits through the RAM Compare project, or a host of, of maternal traits. Probably of those that interest us today would be the traits influencing uh, the birth process and lamb survival, uh, breeding values for you longevity, and more recently, breeding values that have been developed to help us uh, select for greater resistance to worms. But the important bit is probably not how many traits we have available to us, but the fact that we've got a really important framework on which it's very easy to develop new traits, providing you can get hold of the measurements and they can be measured accurately and built into a breeding program. All the framework is there. So, Let's just have a quick think about when performance recording is most useful, because it's very easy to say, oh, let's have a breeding value for that. Let's solve it through genetics. But let's have a think about traits that are, are really well adapted. And so it's things that we can measure in the live animal, um, because then you can go on and use it for future breeding. Uh, any measurements that are cheap are always good in my book. Uh, things we can measure easily, repeatably over an animal's lifetime and uniformly so that different farmers measure them in exactly the same way. You want the trait to be variable and ideally normally distributed. So it's not much help if 80 or 90 percent of the animals in the population have exactly the same measurement. All of those things can be overcome if they don't exist, but those are the things that, that make life easy. We also need to think about whether the trait has an economic value. Obviously, the higher the economic value, the more useful. Uh, and also the degree to which the variation is genetic variation. And uh, I suppose life is also easier if both the high and the low scoring animals stay in the flock. Now, you can see that in the case of health and welfare traits, in many cases, these things are, are not true. These traits can be expensive to measure. They're challenging. They're only seen at the end of an animal's life and actually you're culling in the background uh, to, get, to, to get rid of them. Let's think of a few UK examples. These are areas where we can use genetics and performance recording, but maybe there's some caveats. So those involved in wool shedding have often talked to us about the, the genetics behind uh, that attribute, but they also say it's actually fairly high heritability. We make very rapid progress in about two generations. So by the time we've collected the measurements to be analyzed, to be fed back to us to see which rams to use, actually we've made really good progress through our own on-farm record keeping. So breeding values would be nice, but aren't essential. In the case of lameness, it's one thing just to have a few records of which sheep have been lame at any point in time. But I think the academics would say, if you really want an accurate breeding value, we need to be looking at all four feet, ideally washed feet, scoring them in terms of structure and level of infection, and looking at both the lame and the non-lame individuals to find differences within the flock. So there are probably real limitations in just finding out which animals happen to be lame at a moment in time. You need more detailed phenotyping, unless you've got hundreds of thousands of records coming in 
in which case the number of records can compensate for the quality of the records. And lambing ease in hill breeds can certainly produce a breeding value. It's sensible to assess that trait in the background to ensure that we don't indirectly select against uh, ease of lambing. But if 95% of animals are being born unassisted in these hill environments, you're not going to get much genetic spread. It, it isn't going to be a particularly successful uh, breeding value to, to be chasing. So it all depends on your objectives and how variable your flock is. But just because this is difficult, and I've talked about all the challenges, doesn't mean it's not important and these things can't be overcome. TB in cattle would be a very good example where we've worked with very large data sets. We essentially have the pedigree of all known cattle uh, available through the BCMS data set. Um, and we have the phenotypes available to us through the TB testing. And so although the challenge is massive and the science is complex, breeding values for TB advantage have been produced within dairy sector and are being developed uh, within the beef sector. Before I move to my next bit, the other thing is just to make a passing comment about inbreeding. We can do all sorts of selection for specific uh, traits to improve fertility and survival. However, we do know that as inbreeding levels increase, so you will tend to get a reduction in fertility and survival, certainly at high levels. And so before we actually have these problems, let's ensure that all breeders have access to inbreeding software, that they're monitoring levels of inbreeding over time, and that they're making good decisions uh, to ensure that they keep diversity within the populations so that we don't actually create problems that we didn't have to start with. And there's lots of good advice on the Signet website about uh, inbreeding. At the moment, Signet, I guess, has two different approaches to assessing health and welfare traits. One is having an overarching breeding objective and then data mining to actually deduce the trait. And I'll talk about two examples in a moment. The other is to measure the trait directly and produce a breeding value for it. So in the case of data mining, we're interested in lamb survival. We've got the best part of 6 million records available across all the breeds that we work with, but we're not great at finding out when lambs have died. We know really well how many were born and we know really well when they're born. We know the animals that get measured later in life. We know the animals that go on to become parents later in life. And we can deduce those that were born, but we never heard of ever again. And in that way, we can actually uh, data mine to produce lamb survival EBVs. In a similar way with you longevity, probably understandably, farmers aren't that keen on notifying us every time a ewe dies on the place. And uh, our records of fating codes are, are not particularly widespread. But um, we do know really well when a ewe was born. And we know when she last lambed. So we can produce a breeding value that's really reproductive lifespan. And we can build that into our breeding programs. And there's some really good work. Joe Connington and the, the folk up at SIUC have helped us with that over the years for specific breeds. And that will be uh, rolled out more widely in the future, I'm sure. I thought I'd give a case study where we've measured a specific trait. And I talk about breeding for worm resistance as a, a partial success story. We've made some great strides um, uh, in understanding this trait and also some of the challenges. And as the theme of the conference is working together, it's useful to highlight that this is a project that's all about working together. It's actually the breeders and the breeding groups that initiated this interest. Uh, levy funding has been used to um, support some of the research, but also pump prime the collection of measurements. It's brought researchers together. There's been a lot of work with veterinary labs to actually assess the trait. And then when we've got two, three, or in the case of Clinton um, uh, effect data, 30,000 measurements, we can then build those into the genetic evaluations so that commercial RAM buyers have the breeding values to make more informed decisions. But it's a, a long and complex process. So what are we doing in the UK? Well, we're assessing resistance to parasite challenge. Uh, that's chiefly done uh, up until recently using faecal egg counts. 
arguably those breeders in high challenge pastures are also indirectly selecting for a bit of resilience as well. And I suppose that does highlight one of the challenges of health traits in that uh, you want animals to be experienced to a challenge, and yet we work really hard on our farms to actually minimize uh, that challenge in our farming systems. To date, we've got a large number of measurements, mostly on maternal breeds, but the frustrating factor is that the heritability tends to remain relatively low uh, for um, our FET counts. Now, in recent years, we've looked at new potential phenotypes, one of which is that we know that uh, sheep have an immune response that's very specific uh, to certain uh, stages of infection. And so through that, uh, we can look at IgA levels in the sheep. We've initially looked at that within saliva. Um, that has some promise, but also some challenges. So nice and easy to collect, but the heritability isn't all that we hoped for, even though we see a nice relationship with the strong girls count. And so AHDB is currently funding research this year, looking at IgA levels in blood serum to see if that's going to give us a more heritable uh, phenotype and one that maybe is, is more closely correlated to FEC. So have a look onto the Signet website for more information. We are seeing progress. Um, this is genetic trends, and you know that it takes many years uh, to see progress from the initial animals being measured. But we can see that the um, breeding value for FEC is reducing, which is a good thing because it means less eggs heading out onto pasture. So breeders are using the data. So to look at these two approaches, um, data mining is fantastic. If you've got thousands of historic records, no additional cost associated with data collection. However, it's indirect. There tends to be more noise in the data sets that tends to influence heritabilities, which be a lower and hence rates of gain will tend to be lower. If we're measuring the trait directly, then it's very specific and more accurate. From that, you can develop genomic approaches, which is great. However, you do need some decent data sets, 2,000 plus animals phenotyped, probably vary with the heritability of the trait, time consuming and expensive. And so in that lies a challenge. So looking to the future, um, the impact of health and welfare traits the big thing it's going to depend on is access to the measurements. We have the framework, we have the knowledge and the science to develop them into breeding values, but it's getting access to the measurements. And whether those are things that we get from our farm software programs, whether they're things we can pull through from abattoir data, for example, or other free sources of data uh, remains to be seen, or whether we have to set up phenotyping farms specifically to collect the data would be another approach. And I've not talked much about genomics, but it clearly offers an opportunity once you've got your initial breeding value. Within that, you tend to measure a, a subset within the population of animals for the benefit of the whole of the breed. Now, if you're going to do that, these structures need to be well resourced uh, and tested, and you probably need a different form of business structure so that those that are collecting the measurements are well rewarded. But that can only be achieved through working together. We're not a massive industry, and we need to share our experience, our knowledge, and our data. Crosby, I think that is me done. Uh, again, people are asking about traits, Sam, and one of the ones that's coming through is, are there too many traits? Uh, you know, it, it's a meaningful how do you how are you going to make a meaningful progress yeah throwing 30 traits at farmers isn't particularly useful um once we have these traits then the way forward is to develop uh indexes or sub indexes that actually make the selection decisions easier uh, there's a little bit of software on the signet website now that also enables a bit of customization of indexes so you can say well, Signet say this is our standard breeding index, but actually I want to go twice as fast in terms of breeding for worm resistance. So if I just put some of these traits into a, a sub-index for my own selection decisions, what does that do to my flock? It's a bit of a teaching aid so you can see what happens. And then if the results are interesting, 
you can actually use those. So I think uh, as AHDB Signet, we can give greater guidance with the indexes that we develop. We can update the economic values behind those. We can help people make more progress in a general direction. But I also think an element of giving breeders the tools to customize the direction they want to go in will also help. As you know, I sort of I, I'm I'm a believer in the figures big time, but I would be trying to coax other farmers into looking at figures and it's where do I start? What 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 would you say are the crucial ones that I should get them to start on? Because I'm not going to say there's 30 traits, follow those. <laughs> I'm going to have a maternal line. What would you say is the most important in maternal and what would be the most important two in each uh, in the terminal side? Well it it's a little bit of a conversation about the system. You'd expect me to say that. In fact, you'd expect me not to answer the question yeah, properly. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's finding out about what type of views they have, when they're lambing, and then uh, their current level of production. You know, how many lambs are being dropped at the moment? If that's relatively low, then it's the no-brainer that actually they can be working harder and rearing more lambs. If you've already got a very, very high lambing percentage, then there are other traits you're going to focus on. And also in terms of the end market, thinking about are they sold live or are they sold dead? And if they're sold dead, you know, what do the grades look like at this moment in time? So maternal breeding programs, to try and answer the question, I would be looking at numbers of lambs reared, so litter size EBV. I would be looking at maternal ability. And I'd also be having a little bit of a look at early lamb growth rates. In the future, I think we need to think a little bit about ewe mature size as well. We don't want these ewes just to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and that to negatively impact on the efficiency. And weighing ewes in this day and age is relatively easy with you know, the electronic systems we have. Yep, yeah, oh, totally behind you and up. And although another, another fact within the weighing of the ewes, I think we said I could look at a specific time because there's so many varying weights of the ewes throughout the year. I would actually try to talk about before the ram goes in, before you put them through to the flush would be the initial figure that we should talk about. But again, that's something that, that needs to be, you know, centralized and people can work from. And and, and a, a big belief on the live weight gain on that first six or eight weeks after the mother as the biggest maternal one. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to finish on that that point, yeah. with the work at SRUC at the moment is very much looking at windows for weighing so that we can look at the mating weight and then we can also look at the weaning weight because, as you say, massive fluctuation and that needs taken into account in the breeding values. So, yeah, watch this space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to develop a breeding value for fluke resistance? Oh, I love that answer. <laughs> um, we don't have one at the moment. We'd have to think about what the phenotype is that we could assess uh, within that regard. Maybe that's abattoir data where we can pick things up post-mortem. Um, it would be interesting to see, and others know more than I do, so then we're heading into dangerous territory, but I'm I'm sure there are pen side diagnostic tests that can also pick up elements uh, that might okay. be useful. Um, are you aware of the Smart Sheep project led by the Morden uh, to optimize lamb warming and use of uh, algorithm, my goodness, which identifies underperforming lambs for treatment Therefore, only selected lambs are treated known as the target selective treatment. It's a new one to me. Yeah, it, well, as, as a principle uh, of a management system, I, I'm aware of that. Um, and I can see all the commercial advantages because the funny thing is I always have my pedigree breeding hat on. So I always think all lambs, ideally, you want to treat them the same so we can pick the differences out. But that's a different remit that's all about collecting data to make breeding decisions so yeah i mean the interesting thing in that scenario is if you're recording the number of times animals are drenched in their lifetime that's almost a phenotype isn't it you could actually yeah. select for animals that are drenched less and less times as a, a measurement in itself if they need it drenched is the other bit too indeed and rather than just using the genetic material already available in commercial flocks, what work is being done, if any, in using genetics from the primitive, from primitive breeds to improve the traits in the commercial flocks? Um, well, it, it's all a question of having 
access to the data and having people interested in recording that information. I mean, up until a couple of years ago, we weren't doing a great deal of breed comparison. Um, you know, it's about finding the best animals within a breed, and you can only work with those breeds that you have data for. Um, increasingly, we can move closer to breed comparison, but it needs to be done in a, a structured manner. So if you have a primitive breed, we need to see how it performs relative to others under the same environment before we can tease out elements of that. But um, yeah, we, we've got a few there. You'll see on the website that we're having a bit of a dabble with. Okay. Uh, this next connection, we sort of have uh, be asking the question myself and that would we not be better making progress? You no, know, would we not make more progress with worm resistance by just selecting the fastest growing and therefore the most resilient sheep? Quite a step, but it's important. Yeah, you'll you'll certainly make good progress uh, in terms of um, resilience. The challenge is that fast growing sheep could actually be growing really well, fine, but putting out loads of eggs onto the pasture could be taking all of his mates out. So resistance is trying to find those, as I understand it, that are putting less eggs out onto the pasture. So we can reduce the burden for the entire flock. We can reduce to an extent the amount of drenches that are required. But it's no good if they spend all the time doing that and not performing. So you equally need to find the sheep that will also grow and, and perform. So I, I think we can talk about resistance versus mm -hmm. resilience, but the reality is we need both of those elements within our system yeah i take your point on that although it's certainly a good lead uh, on a direction to head anyway yeah yeah i i'd certainly say if you've got farm software and you can tease those animals out yeah. then uh, mm -hmm. then go for it maybe resistance is the icing on the cake if you're doing a lot of ram breeding and the word environment comes into the next question i was wondering what it would come <laughs> are environmental impacts taken account of in measuring the expression of traits, for example, nutritional plane on fetal egg count. Okay, I'm, I may not be quite answering that question, but we are we are looking at environmental footprint and the impact of genetics. So, in the terminal sire <coughs> side, we're very interested in reducing days to slaughter and understanding the relationship between days to slaughter and growth, because it isn't quite one and the same. It'd be lovely if it was. Um, so having a better understanding of factors that influence days to slaughter, because the, the quicker genetically they can get off the farm, then the lower their environmental footprint in terms of growing lambs. And then other work that would be ongoing is coming back to this st story about ewe efficiency. Um, you know, let's have a look at output relative to the size of the ewe, because the size of the ewe will be influencing the resources required to keep that ewe. Um, so looking at, uh, at that, obviously feed efficiency is the icing on the cake, but very expensive to measure. But there are others that are looking at selecting for feed efficiency, again, with the view to reducing environmental impact. And the CL funded project, uh, you benefit that I'm involved with at the moment, is trying to look at indexes, both from an economic point of view and also from an environmental point of view. Uh, to see how different they are as selection goals and what advice we can give to industry. Yeah, we're doing really well on the time here, but I'm going to make this the last question with Sam. And <laughs> it's something we all ask each other. Um, why are farmers inherently skeptical about figures and EBVs? Now, that's not all farmers, obviously, but uh, there appears to be a reluctantly slow uptake, even on the inheritable traits like the muscle and the growth rates. Can you give me, uh, certainly I've asked that many times, I don't know why farmers are slow to pick up on it. Have you any thoughts? It's probably a conversation for another 40 or 50 minutes. That, that's the <laughs> challenge. We're doing a little bit of work in-house looking at these behavioral systems. And I was trying to think uh, how, where our um, interest in the show ring, for example, does that become a habit or a, a behavior as we walk around trying to select rams um, and our, our sort of gut in, instinct there? It, it's a shame that the data isn't used more in dairy, pigs, poultry. It's instinct, isn't it? I think yeah. on sheep, one of my big challenges is the element of mob mating, which makes it harder to see with your own eyes the benefit of genetics. If you were using one ram with 50 ewes, you measured those lambs, you measured the others, you'd see it with your own eyes. 
you only need to see once that it's making more money and you instantly do it. If you head out and buy one fantastic ram, shove him in with another six and get a crop of lambs, there's an element of trust that his genetics have actually come through and influenced that lamb crop. So it is harder to measure progeny performance in sheep, I would argue, than it is in some of the other species. And that has slowed things up. Yeah, I always think it's strange. A year after you buy a ram and you get it seared and you look at the rams that you bought and do a comparison then, it's a bit different to when you first looked at them. But then, of course, you're meant to look at the figures also uh, if you're buying from the EBVs. There are surprises there as well. But look, we've reached the yeah. end of our time, Sam. And again, thank Pleasure. you very much. Very informative. And thanks very much for your time on that. Thank you very much. So uh, the last person speaking in uh, session two, we have, um, oh, I've lost my material here. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry, Alex. <laughs> Alex, Corbiskly. Sorry, Alex, about that. Um, Alex is a farm an animal vet, currently working as a senior lecturer in the farm animal practice at the University of Edinburgh. He's worked in the clinical practice in Northamptonshire, Cheshire, Midlothian, and com completed his PhD, cattle immunology and vaccine de development at the Rosen and Morden Research Institute. He now divides his time between teaching vet students, clinical consultancy, consul consul I'll tell you tomorrow, and research. His main research interests include clinical veterinary medicine, antibiotic use and resistance and immunology. Over the past two years, he's very he's led a levy board funded project examining newborn lamb and calf survival in Great Britain. And we're covering the subject of improving lamb survival and important and, and performance, a very important part of the farm sheep farmer's mind. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Crosby. Uh, so as Crosby said, I've been asked to present the results from a two-year project that's been funded by the UK Levy Boards. Could you just bring my slides up, please? Thank you very much. Uh, so in the next 20 minutes, I'm probably not going to be able to do this project its justice. So if you do have questions or if I've gone over things too briefly, please do pop me an email and my email address is there on the cover slide. So this project was a collaboration between ourselves in Edinburgh and uh, scientists and vets at the University of Liverpool, Nottingham, and of course at Synergy Farm Health as well. And the context of this project, I think, is really nicely summed up by this paper that was published about five years ago by Cathy Dwyer and colleagues, really looking at uh, why neonatal lamb survival hasn't really improved. And the key punchline, and they, they really get to the chase in the start of their abstract to this paper, is that neonatal mortality in small ruminant livestock has remained stubbornly unchanging over the past 40 years. Now that's despite there being quite a lot of improvement in understanding the biology of why lambs survive uh, or don't survive. So really the focus of this project was to look at what we know about the biology and try and understand why it's not implemented on farms, and then also try to add to the biology where there are gaps in our knowledge. So the key questions I'm going to talk about today, are: uh, what does neonatal lamb survival look like in Britain at the moment? How are current practices related to survival? Uh, a big component of the project was some social science work that was led by Anne Bruce and Katie Adam elsewhere in the University of Edinburgh that were looking at the barriers and enablers to change. And then when we think about some of the biological determinants that we don't really understand yet fully, is how is ewe metabolic status related to lamb survival and performance? And then what relationship is there with lamb uh, performance and antibiotic treatment at birth, which is still quite a common practice for, for young lambs? So the study was broken up into a number of different work areas. One is, we started off with an online survey to farmers at the end of 2018. And the objective of that survey was to benchmark performance between flocks, to understand current practices, and to understand attitudes to neonatal survival. We then wanted to work with a subset of these farmers to actually measure performance on their flocks in 2019. And we did that by working with vets and vet students. And you may well be aware that we have vet students uh, that go out to do their lambing placements predominantly in their first and second years. And they're a great resource to try and capture data from farms with respect to performance. Something that Sam alluded to in his talk earlier about that big gap in knowledge between 
uh, the number of lambs that are born and what happens to them between birth and, and recording later in life or sale. The social sciences component involved a number of interviews with both farmers and their vets, and it was vet farmer pairs where the interview took place. And that really was focusing on trying to unpick the barriers and enable us to change. So really linking to what Jasmine was talking about in terms of uh, driving change on farm. And then the experimental trial uh, was done on our own flock up at the University of Edinburgh, where we blood sampled all the ewes in our flocks to determine their metabolic status. And we blood sampled all of our lambs to understand their colostrum antibody or their passive transfer status. We also randomized the lambs to getting an oral antibiotic or a control, a placebo at birth. And then we looked to see what the performance uh, and uh, relationship was between what we'd measured and lamb survival and performance. So the survey was promoted online and via various uh, news outlets to all the levy payers across England, Scotland and Wales, which you know, were total over 100,000 uh, farmers that were potentially uh, available to respond to the survey. Now, it was accessed just under 1,800 times. It was only started by 384 farms. Now, of the 203 farms actually completed the survey, so once folk and started with the survey, most of them finished. And given that it was quite an arduous survey, that, that was quite positive. It, what we were disappointed with was the number of responses we got. And I don't have time to talk about that in detail today, but, but there's some interesting um, discussions around that. But out of the 203 that responded, we had 23 that were looking at suckler herds only, 125 that had lambing flocks only, and then 55 that had both a lambing flock and a suckler herd. And as Crosby mentioned at the start, this project was looking at both beef and uh, lamb survival, or suckler calf and, and lamb survival. Today, I'm really focusing, obviously, on the lamb survival components, but some of the uh, behavioral work that we did, some of the interviews did cover both suckler and lamb survival. So there'll be a, a few mentions of, of calves occasionally during the talk. Now, out of the 180 lambing flocks that we had survey responses, 111 of those were actually recruited by our vets and, and vet students involved in the study. And because the majority of our responses were really focused on that subset that we were working with, we sort of refocused things a bit for the project, really to focus on that 111 farms across uh, England, Scotland and Wales and, and a few in Northern Ireland as well. So what were the vets and the vet students doing in 2019? Well, they completed the online survey with the farms, so they helped us to capture that data. And then the vets with their farms would ring them on a weekly basis to get an accurate record of all of the uh, lamb uh, outcomes for that week. So how many lambs had been born, how many had died, uh, what they died of, how many had been treated, for example. Now, the students, we were able to get a bit more granularity in the data. They're on the farm for an intense period of time. Some are there for three or four weeks. Some are there for a few days. But we got them whilst they're on their placements to record uh, the daily results around lamb survival and, um, and uh, outcomes whilst they were on the farm. So if we look at the headline performance for the flocks, the 111 flocks where the vets and the vet students were collecting data, you can see here that there was a strong bias towards lowland flocks. So just over half of the flocks were um, reported to be lowland by the farms. And in terms of size, we were looking at around 500, just over 500 acres. Very few organic farms within the study population. And if we look at flock size, it's just over 530 ewes on average. A bit surprisingly, they seem to have a reasonable high level of staffing on these uh, flocks. So um, the farmers reported having about 165 uh, females per full time equivalent. Uh, and the average number that were actually lambed during the study period for each herd, uh, each flock, sorry, because we weren't um, collecting data for the entire lambing period for all flocks was around 250 uh, ewes. And that was at a lambing percentage of around 165%. So the headline figures, which um, most of you guys will be interested in, in were the mortality to 21 days old. The median for that uh, was around 8% and the mean was around 10%, which is very comparable to data that was collected 20 years ago. So that sort of backs up Cathy Dwyer's work showing that there's not been a lot of change in that over recent decades. And you can see here the vast majority of this mortality occurs in the first seven days. So 9.5% mean loss up to the first week and almost the same if you look at the median uh, between uh, seven days and, and 21 days. Now what was interesting if we plot the uh, mortality that was recorded by the vets and the vet students uh, by 
flock size. You can see that quite a range of flock sizes, only a couple that were over 2,000, but we did have some, some quite large flocks. And you can see there's no obvious relationship between lamb mortality uh, and flock size. And actually, in terms of looking at the risk factors overall, we didn't find any really strong associations with management practices. Um, and, and lamb survival. And that was very similar to, again, work that was conducted in the UK 20 years ago. And um, I'll talk about that a bit later and, and the relevance of that. As I showed you on the previous slide, there was no association with farm size. There was also no association with staff to uh, breeding female ratio. I mentioned on the previous slide that that was sort of slightly lower than we might be expecting, but there was a big range in that. And our interpretation of these two findings is really that being efficient in terms of scale and labor utilization doesn't automatically then lead to being less efficient in terms of lamb survival. And large flocks that are very efficient with staff utilization can achieve excellent outcomes. And really it's about the quality of staffing and the quality of supervision and uh, the way the system has been run rather than um, those potentially a bit more basic metrics of, of, um, of the farm. Perhaps unsurprisingly, and I don't think this graph will um, really be a shock to anybody, there was more variability in mortality in, in outdoor lambing flocks. For those of you wondering what the mixed category were here, these were predominantly flocks that were putting ewes and lambs out during the day, but still bringing them in at night. Now, what we did do is we asked the farmers to report what their survival and mortality was in 2018. And we compared that to the land mortality that we recorded through the vets and the vet students the following season. So what you're looking at here is each dot is a farm and you've got what they reported in 2018 and what we recorded in 2019. And what's striking here is that we have a, a sort of a proportion of flocks where there is good correlation or good agreement between the two seasons. So the 2018 farmer recorded performance is very similar to the 2019 vet and vet student reported performance. We then have a group of farms up here that had much worse performance in 2019 uh, than they recorded in 2018. And the flip side on this side, we have the farms where they had a uh, much better performance in 2019 than they reported in 2018. Now, everybody has a bad year and everybody has a good year. But what this would suggest is that on a significant proportion of flocks, we have a problem either with consistency and or recording. And if you were to think about the pig industry or the poultry industry, I appreciate very different systems, very uniform systems, are very much more controlled systems. But one of the things that facilitates improvement is that consistency and being able to build on that consistency from year to year. And if you're one of these flocks here or here where that consistency isn't present, it's very hard to really build on that and to make progress. And that was quite striking. We saw this in the suckler farmers as well, actually. When we looked into it a bit more detail, because of course we can't unpick whether this is inaccurate recording or true variability between years. About a quarter of the farmers that reported performance for 2018 used some paper records to do that. 11% used computer records, but two thirds, so two and three of the farmers uh, said that they were giving us their best estimates from memory. And one in three farmers did absolutely no recording at all of, of uh, newborn lamb survival. So we moved on to try and understand what farmers feel about uh, neonatal survival and what the motivators were. And I don't think this slide will be a surprise to anybody. Um, farmers were generally viewing neonatal survival as very important for the success of their business. You can see a strong uh, positive uh, response to, to that question. Um, uh, and then a mix between whether they were concerned or not, which may be underpinned by you know, how well they felt performance reflected um, their flock. Now, we did ask them how they felt neonatal survival in their flock compared to average and whether it was better than average. And quite interestingly, that distributed completely evenly between sort of the positive and the, and the negative responses to that question. So we, we dove into that a little bit more detail and we plotted out the survival or the mortality in uh, 2019 against how the farmer reported their performance relative to average. And I took the mean at 10% as what most folk would understand as average. And Curiously, actually, farmers that were performing better generally did have better performance. And those that were you know, quite confident that their performance was better than average generally were better than average. However, there was a group of uh, folk that were very confident that their performance was better than average. And half of those were actually performing uh, worse than average. So it, this effect is well described by social scientists as the Dunning-Kruger effect, where some of the most confident folk may actually not be performing um, as they thought they were. 
when we asked farmers about whether they felt they could influence neonatal survival, generally they were very uh, positive about this. They felt they had the ability and the understanding and the skills to be able to do that. So there was a general trend towards feeling quite positive about being able to influence it. But really interestingly, when we asked uh, why they do what they do, the real driver here was about wanting to do the right thing. So they wanted uh, to work hard at uh, lamb survival uh, because it was associated with being good at their job, uh, because it's the right thing to do, um, because it would improve and be the right thing for their flock, um, or it was um, something that they wanted to do as a choice they wanted to make. And really these external factors, such as folk would think badly of them, or their vet has told them to do it, uh, or because other people um, might, um, they might want to show other people that they can do that, really were not strong drivers. And that's, uh, in some ways, really great news for the industry. It shows that we're actually all really motivated to do this. There's a strong desire to do it. And that comes from a, an internal source of, of motivation, not from uh, what other people may be um, telling, telling people to do on their own farm. And I think this uh, really sums it up. This is one of the quotes from the interviews that, that took place. Uh, and I thought it was quite powerful. I just don't like losing things. And I take it really, really badly when I do. And it's not about money. It's more about what everything, uh, you want everything to do as well as it can. And the interviews, unfortunately, we can't go into them in, in a lot of detail today, uh, but they were really quite powerful and they pulled out some really interesting messages. Now, some of them will be of no surprise to you. So for example, there were a number of practical barriers to change, most notably housing and shelter, particularly for tenanted farms. Um, and Crosby sort of already mentioned staffing, time, money, those sorts of things. So those certainly came out in the discussions. But also what came out strongly in the discussions was the cultural barrier to talking about mortality as sort of a social stigma and an emotional discomfort around it. Now, I'm the worst person in the world to talk about this. My wife would, would make testament to that. However, it came through very strongly as an area of, of barrier to actually uh, recording data and to then to discussing and, and looking at that data. That said, there were really strong drivers for improvement. We've talked about that high level of motivation and both the financial and the emotional benefits were recognised uh, to actually improving uh, lamb survival and performance. So a few quotes, I said that there'd be a, some from the cattle as well as sheep, but you know, one of the quotes that came through I thought was quite interesting. You know, one of the problems I think that there is, is that farmers don't talk. You're not going to say to people, by the way, we had 40 dead calves this year. You're not going to do that. Likewise, one vet commented that in the past 12 months, they'd had to signpost some clients uh, for help and recognizing the impact that a really bad year can have on people's well-being. In terms of uh, looking at improvement and drivers for improvement, there was a lot of focus on getting back to the basics. You know, quite often we get away from that. And if we go back to the basics, can we actually um, you know, address some of the underlying factors that um, we've missed over the past few years? And again, this reflected by some of the vets saying in nutrition, getting that right, hygiene and colostrum, if we can get these things right, I think uh, generally it, most of it probably follows itself. So before I wrap up, I wanted to just talk through some of the results from the experimental trial that we did, where we wanted to look at eunutrition, lamb colostrum and antibiotic treatment uh, to see whether you know, we, we can look at more of the factors that might determine whether we have a crop of lambs that look like this guy here or this one here. So in terms of our study, uh, we worked with our own flock of 250 ewes that lamb in March or April. Our ewes are generally in pretty good body condition. They're pampered, spoiled vet school sheep. Uh, they're always scanned and we metabolic profiled them this year, as, as I mentioned earlier. The lambs, uh, we monitored all of our singles and twins uh, from birth through to weaning. Uh, and we don't actually uh, rear triplets on the ewes. Normally they're fostered on, but for this year, we artificially reared the triplets so that we could control the study. We looked at lamb growth disease rates, we looked at the antibiotic treatment, and we took a blood sample from our lambs uh, at birth to look at their antibody levels. So that started in March, um, and then we followed them through lambing in April, and then we, uh, throughout the entire summer period, looked at any deaths or treatments and, and the weaning weights as well. So very quickly, looking at the metabolic status of our flock, uh, we looked at four things, BHB, which is short-term energy balance, uh, urea nitrogen, which is sort of short-term protein supply into the rumen, blood albumin, which is a longer-term measure of, of protein status, and globulin. 
And I don't have time to talk about these in a lot of detail, but what I wanted to focus on here was the albumin, where about half of our ewes had low blood albumin levels going into lambing, despite having been rationed according to their energy and protein requirements, and despite predominantly being in pretty good energy balance. We've only got five ewes here uh, that were in poor energy balance. So we were quite interested in the relationship of this poor long-term or marginal long-term energy, uh, sorry, protein status and, and performance in the sheep. In terms of blood antibody levels in lambs, there aren't any established cutoffs, but if we use the dairy and the beef cutoffs, the dairy one is at 10 and the beef one's at around 24 uh, mg per mil of, of uh, IgG, which is the antibody that we're measuring in the blood. About one in 10 lambs were below what we would consider acceptable for a dairy calf, and one in three lambs were below what you'd consider acceptable for a suckler calf. So the first thing we wanted to look at was uh, losses between scanning and 24 hours old. Now, unsurprisingly, you would uh, expect to see this. That did vary by litter size. So none of our single carrying ewes lost any lambs. Um, 14 of our um, twin carrying ewes uh, lost one or more lambs. Um, and 16 out of our 50 triplet carrying ewes lost, lost one or more lambs, so about a third of them. And we looked at a number of factors. And the only two that came out as significant were the number of lambs scanned, as, as I've mentioned, and as you'd expect, and also blood albumin. So ewes that lost a lamb were more likely to have lower blood albumin than the ewes that didn't lose a lamb. So it's not just that we've got our reference ranges wrong. It is actually associated with a production impact in the flock. We also wanted to look at the factors that influence blood antibody levels, and we used the beef cutoff at 24. We actually looked at a number of different things, but this was the one that was most interesting. So um, even though it's a cutoff validated in a different species, we thought we'd look at it in lambs. And actually, the um, factors that influence that, we looked at a range. Litter size, again, probably not surprising that triplets are more likely to have problems with clostral antibodies, but actually use in negative energy balance. So use with high beta hydroxybutyrate were five times more likely uh, to have a lamb with uh, insufficient antibody levels. Uh, and you know, it's well established that using poor energy balance are more likely to lose their lambs. And this sort of um, shows one of the mechanisms through colostrum, how that might happen. If we then look at performance from 24 hours old, uh, unfortunately for our study, but good for the flock and the lambs, only about 4% of lambs died after 24 hours old and only about 2.5% were treated. So we didn't really have enough data to really unpick the risk factors uh, for that. But we did look at live weight gain and the average live weight gain for the flock was about 0.3 kilos a day. And the top third averaged about 0.35 and the bottom third about 0.26. So we looked at the risk factors for being a poorer growing lamb. So having a growth rate of under 0.26. Uh, and we looked at a range of the ones I've shown you before. And the two we thought we were most likely to come out as significant were being given additional colostrum um, and having um, antibody levels that were low. So that beef cut off of 24 mg per mil. Uh, and actually colostrum didn't come out as significant, uh, being supplemented with colostrum didn't come out as significant. However, having poor colostral transfer, so having low blood antibody levels, again, nearly five times more likely to be in that poorer growing uh, category. So we can really show that that beef cut off uh, is applicable to lambs and is associated with, with poorer performance. And there was no impact of oral antibiotics on lamb performance in any of the measures that we looked at in our study. So that getting oral antibiotics or not getting it made no difference at all. So I'm conscious I'm running a little bit over time. So I'm going to wrap up in terms of the key findings uh, in neonatal mortality in, in, in GB. The median's about 8% uh, and most of that's in the first seven days. And there's no relationship to farm size or staffing levels. And there's this poor correlation between reported performance in one season and actual performance in the subsequent season. In terms of attitudes, there's a real uh, desire, a real want uh, to do this well, and it comes from an internal source and, and confidence in uh, the ability to make improvements. But there is a cultural stigma uh, around recording, particularly, and discussion. And in terms of sort of novel determinants of performance or backing up determinants of performance, uh, poor U long-term protein status was predictive of increased lamb losses. Uh, poor U energy balance was predictive of poor colostral status in the lambs. And lambs with poor colostral status were at increased risk of poorer growth. And in a flock where disease was generally well controlled, oral antibiotic really made no difference to lamb outcomes at all. 
So where do we need to go with this? Uh, what are the next steps? We need imaginative and creative ways of addressing those barriers to recording and discussing performance. And, and we've been looking at um, working with pilot farms at that. Um, and that's a talk for another day, I think. Uh, we need a focus on survival probably more than talking about mortality. It's easier to talk about survival. It's a more positive thing to focus on. And we need to agree targets for improvements. And improvements uh, in terms of changes, they need to be practical and they need to be farm specific. A generic five point plan just isn't going to work. This isn't lameness in sheep. This isn't contagious mastitis in, in cows. This is complex and we need to find the risk factors on individual farms and we need interventions and potentially even targets that are not just achievable, but, but tailored to the farm. So I apologize to the uh, organizers for overrunning there and um, I'm conscious I'm between you and your lunch break, but I do want to acknowledge the phenomenal effort from all of the partners um, that have been involved in this and also the funding uh, of the levy boards who supported this work. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Alec, thank you very much indeed. A lot of figures coming in there and I, certainly I would follow on the figures a lot myself and uh, the first two questions that are coming in relate. Uh, I myself now I would find that um, I would actually include premature or sorry abortions that would maybe have happened in the month before lambing. You always get something somewhere amongst that. Um, I would maybe lose about seven percent in the first counting that in with the first twenty four hours, and then maybe another seven percent of weaning coming in line with what you're talking. about. the other questions that are coming in here is the lambing mortality alive against the scan number or is it against the number of lambs actually born mm -hmm. and question coming in any association between scanning percentage and mortality in other words flock scanning 200 percent losing more than a flock say is 150. Yeah, so no, really great questions, Crosby. And they start to get underneath some of the complexity to, to getting accurate recordings. So in terms of the data we collected in 2019, uh, so the actual data we, we've shown in terms of the numbers, that was the, the percentage of lambs died out of the ones that were born. Okay, so it was out of everything that was born, what died? Now that was very difficult to obtain in the surveys because a lot of folk don't record actually the number of lambs that were born. So for the 2018 farmer surveys, we had to go with what they'd scanned. So there's, there's slight differences to how we can collect that data based on what data is available on farm. Now, certainly, yes, you know, if you're scanning at a high percentage, you will often be at increased risk of losing more lambs. And what we don't want to do is push towards out improving output by actually having a lot more dead lambs along the way. And you would much rather be a flock that was scanning at a lower percentage and losing fewer lambs. Um, and, and as an industry, I think there's, there's a lot of um, sort of focus on making sure that that's what we're doing. We're not just driving a very high lambing percentage and losing a lot of lambs along the way. I'm not sure if that's answered the more because I think you sort of wrapped up three together there, Crosby. But <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you could really take it. Oops, sorry, I've lost myself here. Uh, you could take it a good bit further there. Um, right, there are quite a few questions, but I think we'll just take a few more. Uh, we'll have good time. It's two o'clock before the next session starts, so we'll maybe got a few people's lunch short. 2018 was very cold with a lot of snow, and 2019 was very wet. Having had nearly six months of continuous rain in the southwest, was the weather affecting indoor and outdoor lambing, taken into account with variability. In other words, have you taken that into account? Yeah, so we, we did ask the, the farms, because of course our farms are distributed um, across the country and you get quite different local conditions. And again, as the question points out, you've got a different effect, whether they're indoor or outdoor. So we did ask the farms whether they felt that it was a typical year or not. And we did have a number that would say, yep, yeah, actually one of those years was not um, a typical year. So we, we did look at that and we have accounted for it. The uh, the observation is that yes, we all, some of us have very bad years and some of us have very good years, uh, but one of the challenges to making improvement is that for a significant proportion of the flocks, there was inconsistency between years. And, and that's a real challenge, um, particularly um, if you have factors like the weather that are impacting performance. And one of the messages and one of the things to think about is how can we control that or how can we manage the risk of that? So what practical things can we do? And if we're lambing outside, are there things we can do around lamb shelters um, and mitigating the effects of weather so that we try and get away from some of this variability? Some of it is, of, of course, at the planning stage of the system. You know, should we be targeting the time that we're lambing around when we typically have the most difficult conditions? Uh, or do we spread the risk? 
Um, and one of the things that was quite notable, it came through very strongly in, in the uh, beef side, actually, um, more than the sheep, but it was a feature of both, was that the length of the lambing or calving period wasn't really associated with mortality. So that um, that spreading of the risk over a different time period or using your labour differently didn't necessarily uh, have a big impact on, on whether you lost lots of lambs or calves. Thank you. When do you suggest the best time of the year would be for blood samples? Uh, yeah, quite a broad question there. So we looked very specifically at um, metabolic status pre lambing and the best time to do that's three weeks off lambing because that's when those ewes are just about to go into their peak twin lamb risk period so if you want to be able to spot a problem and deal with it you know, just before it happens then three weeks pre lambing is the best time to do that uh, if you're looking for different things like um, mineral status or you know pre-tupping then there are different times to sample but in terms of what we presented today uh, it's three weeks before lambing it really would come, I would continue that question and say, if you're finding the blood samples are good or fine, is there any point in doing additional boluses or minerals? And that, would that also maybe be a, another blood uh, sample maybe taken before the ram goes in, before the flush? Yeah, so if you're interested in specific minerals, um, so for example, copper, selenium, uh, cobalt, that's the best time to do that is before the tubs go in. Uh, and that can really help guide decide whether you want to provide additional supplementation or not. Uh, lovely. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Has the lamb survival study, the album in one, oops, sorry, it's jumped over here, uh, been published yet? And if so, would you put it to, uh, would you put it to a link somewhere, please? Okay, Grant, so there's a few questions around the album. So what I might just do, if they're able to put the slides up, is just um, whiz back to the albumin and slide on that. So, because there's a few questions around it, one of them also asking about the cutoff and whether the cutoff is right. So, we used a cutoff of 30 grams per litre, um, and that's a very old cutoff. And I'm not about to pin my professional reputation or the future of the sheep industry on a cutoff of 30 grams per litre. Uh, but that's based on a heparin sample um, for the person who asked that question. There are different cutoffs depending on the type of blood you have. Now, it's not published. I'm very happy to make this available and I can do that through Liz and the organisers. So, so we'll pick up on that after the, um, after the talk. But the cutoff is irrelevant for the findings of this study. The findings of this study show that ewes that have a lower, uh, ewes that lose a lamb between scanning and 24 hours old are more likely to have a lower blood albumin. So the cutoff we use is, is 30. Uh, there's a debate as to whether that's an appropriate cutoff or not, but the lower the blood albumin, the more likely the ewe is to lose a lamb. And I've actually done similar analysis, which I can't share with you on, a, on an experimental trial in France, and we saw exactly the same results. So French sheep do the same thing as Scottish sheep. I can't help you on English or Welsh sheep at the moment, or even Irish ones, Crosby, but we've got two countries <laughs> at least where we've seen the same effect. <laughs> A very uh, emphasised question, how do you ensure that your blood album and level are right? And there's another question, what diet were the yields fed in the trial? Yeah, so I think the the um, albumin level, when I tried to wrap up in that response, I was sort of scanning ahead, sorry, Crosby, but the other one okay. in terms in terms of uh, the nutrition of these sheep, so they were on haylage that had been analysed, it was good quality haylage, I can't remember the exact numbers now, and then the singles didn't get any supplementary feeding, and the twins and the triplets got a flat rate um, feeding, and again, I'd have to check whether it was three quarters of uh, whether it was three quarters of a kilo or a kilo um but the use the triplets and the twin carrying use got the same level of supplementation which is interesting because actually we saw some differences between them that i haven't had time to talk about today but it was a very simple um silage and, and sort of traditional cake system or oh, haylage sorry i'm gonna give you one last question and it's just it was back on the line there um what were the main influences for farmers believing they were able to improve their neonatal lamb mortality? Was it advice from the vets? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand, understood the question. So um, they generally felt very confident in their abilities um, and they felt that they were well prepared um, to, uh, to sort of meet the challenge. 
Um, they were very engaged with their vets. Um, and what I was trying to get across in the talk was that they were doing this because they felt it was important, not because their vets were telling them that it was important. Um, and we did have some questions about where they got their information from, and they're using a wide variety of sources for getting information. So um, it's not just the vets, it's not just their advisors, it's colleagues, it's neighbors, it's friends, it's the media. So there's a lot of different places where um, they're looking for information to look at survival. I am going to finish off on that, and Alex, thank you very much. And I repeat again, a very big thank you to Jasmine, Sam, and yourself on this session. Very good papers put forward. I've been very interested in them, and I think with the questions coming forward, it's been excellent. So thank you. Thanks, Crosby. Um, the there is there's now a a, a refreshment break. Um, coming back on at two o'clock. What we're asking is that uh, anyone, in fact. There's nearly 250 people then listening to this session, so that's quite a good number. Thank you very much for coming in on that. Hope you find it interesting. I um, want you to have a look at the sponsors pages because like everything else, we can't do this without having the sponsorship. So thank you very much to them. And uh, I'm going to sign off now and you're back in again at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>